you. And as such, I kind of wanted to show you as much as I could without overloading you. It's very, very difficult to create a presentation introducing a library without showing code. Um, I, I would try and have funny pictures, but then I'll just have to give you the code in the form of interpretive jazz dance, and that would not work well. So there is a lot of code. Um, I'm actually trying to show you two JavaScript libraries. So there's even more code. I'm very sorry. Um, so essentially, <laughs> uh, you're in for a ride. If you don't get everything at first, all of the slides will be obviously posted so you can explore and enjoy to your heart's content. So having said that, I guess we'll, we'll kick off. Thank you very much for turning up. Some of you were very eager. It was nice to see. Uh, if, however, you do feel after those caveats, this isn't for you. There are some glorious people speaking in some other rooms. But if you would like to stay here, then I appreciate your time and your bums on the seats. So my name is Matt Giffords. Uh, I've done a bit about me already. Uh, some of you might know me. Those that don't, I look forward to meeting you. I'll be the guy surrounded by coffee cups. Um, I'm at Coffee Monkey on Twitter. Most people know me by that. I've been a consultant developer uh, for a long time. I never had hair then either. So it's been a while. Uh, I absolutely love development. It's my passion. I'm really, really fond of it. I like building cool things. I like writing about the cool things that I've built as well. Uh, I drink a bug of gin too, so feel free to ask questions on that. Uh, and I'm a proud developer for a uh, distributed team uh, over in the States, an uh, independent music distributor. So that's, that's the current project that I am thoroughly enjoying. So as a long-time CF developer, and kind of a long-time JavaScript developer, one of the things I really love about Confusion is, has always been creating with APIs. Uh, I've also loved writing wrappers that interact with other people's APIs. Some of you might use the Twitter one, there are a few I've got out there. Essentially my GitHub repos, uh, API repos, it's been insane. That's how I spend my evenings. But having explored a few JavaScript libraries, I found that for me, uh, Vue.js seems to be the perfect companion for the Cold Fusion APIs. That's completely open to interpretation, that's not rock solid law, that's just my opinion. And of course, Cold Fusion, I think, is an ideal tool for creating super fast uh, APIs and endpoint delivery systems. So we're going to get straight into it if you're all ready. So Vue.js, for those that don't know what Vue.js is, it is a progressive framework. It allows you to build incrementally in small stages. So if you're in an agile development team where you have a small project and you just want to try Vue.js, uh, this is an ideal tool to, to use, really, to play around. You don't have to build an application using Vue from the ground up completely. If you have an existing Cold Fusion application, or a PHP, or God forbid, uh, an ASP application, um, you will not be uh, kicked out of the room. You can easily add some Vue.js components into that. Uh, you might just have a sidebar in your site that you maybe want to play with uh, fetching news items or blog feeds. That might be a perfect way just to, just to experiment. So you're using a small subsection of your site to play with the new toys. Furthermore, Vue.js is component-based, very heavily component-based once you get into it which means it's very easy to create components. And ultimately, this is the big uh, reason for using Vue, it's modular. You have to kind of think about the application that you're building and see how you can reuse these components to essentially streamline your code base, and make it easier to test and easier to work with. So in terms of getting started, there are lots of different ways. Um, a few examples I start off with just use um, a few JS that I've pulled from a, a content delivery network, so I'm not going to bore you with that because you've all seen that before. Uh, one important note is that Vue.js does not support IE8 browsers in Windows. So unfortunately, if you or your clients use it, then um, you're a little bit out of luck and you should probably upgrade. Uh, it has some uh, features that are only supported uh, in ECMAScript 5 compliant browsers, and IE8 just doesn't have capabilities for it. The first thing I would highly recommend before you even install or download Vue.js, if you're even considering it, is download the uh, dev tools. It's a plugin for Firefox and Google Chrome. 
It's a fantastic tool. It's fairly self-explanatory, so I'm not going to go into too much detail on that. If you've ever used the console debug in the standard browser, this is a massive add-on that is essentially built for this library. You can grab it from GitHub, which is simple Google will do. It allows you to essentially inspect any component that you have in your application, dig down, see what data it has, what data it's passing to other components. When you actually start to get data stores in, which we'll look at later on, it allows you to inspect those data stores and even kind of time travel and build that data back so you can see certain states of your application as you go. So, that's the preamble. To get started, very easy, you just create a new view instance once you have your JavaScript module in place. The first thing you need to do in your HTML or your CFM template is to define a div element with a particular ID, and you need to give that ID to the view so that it knows that that element is the, is the content holder for which all of the, uh, the components should be placed once they are rendered. There are lots of other properties within the view instance, but we'll go through them as we read them along the way. Uh, the first one as well is the data object. This is literally just a data object. Any property and value that we store in there will be added to View's reactivity system. So behind the scenes, View actually creates getters and setters for you so that it knows what to do with those particular data properties. If anyone has ever used mustache templating before and the double curly brace syntax, View uses that as well, so it's nice and easy to actually output your particular bits of information. It's a stupidly simple way to render the data to be done. So in the process, we have my new view instance. I have a static message there, hello monkey. It should always be spelled with a Y, never with, a, with an H, so it's with a Y. I have my div element, and just to output that message, I've got the message variable with the twin curly brackets. That, uh, the data and the DOM are now linked, and everything is now reactive. So in my kick-ass example, you can tell I'm a graphic designer and a UI specialist. As soon as you load the page, you actually have that value instantly visible. The fact that we're using a JavaScript application and the view instance is assigned to a JavaScript variable, we can use just the box standard Chrome uh, console to change that on the fly as well. And you can see the Vue.js is completely reactive and updates to the change on that particular property. Conditionals in Vue are also incredibly easy. They're also quite fun as well. In this awesome example, again, I've got another view instance. I have a Boolean value called show. At the very top, I have a simple button that has a click event. You might notice it's unlike standard HTML where we don't have to define a lot of other uh, extra information, just have a click and we give it the name of something to do. A click event could be a JavaScript function, or it could be, in this case, inline JavaScript that literally just switches the value of that show boolean. So if it's true, set it to false, if it's false, set it to true. And then we have a p tag with the v if directive on there. Depending on the value of show, that will either show or hide that, that, uh, that paragraph. So again, oh, another, another awesome example. Please play. There we go. Bet you didn't guess that was going to happen. And again, because it's JavaScript, we can jump straight down to the console and we can update the value. So if you're writing a view application, you don't always have to interact with the UI to step through everything to see what's going to change. If you're working on uh, the actual user interface, you can test it very quickly, very easily in the console just by changing the data properties that you have set. Another great example for this is if you have logged in user states, your user might have a particular role, you do not want them to see particular things. View makes this stupidly easy as well. Again, exactly the same principle, we're just using the if directive to control the display. On top of the if, we also have an else. Who would have thought it? The else directive, there is a condition here. The else directive must be placed directly beneath if you cannot have another tag or any other elements between them, otherwise the view will not know what that else actually relates to. But it's just another really useful way of uh, conditioning the display of your particular logic. Moving in data iteration, view makes this incredibly easy as well. I've got, uh, I'm a music, so in my particular example, in the end case example, it's going to be musician based. 
So I have an array of artists, and I just want to loop over them. And there's a very simple directive for that as well, V4. So for every artist in my artist's array, please declare the artist's name for me. And it does. And again, because it's JavaScript, we can interact with that directly and just push another object into our array. And lo and behold, Vue.js will update for us as well. It really does simplify how we work and what we can do. We can update the full loop. We can include an optional index as well, which is quite useful, should you ever need it. And there might be instances where you need it. One of the loop uh, attributes is a very, very special attribute called the key attribute. It's used by Vue as a hint for Vue's virtual DOM system to essentially detect if particular elements in that list have changed, it will use that key as a unique identifier for those list values. In this particular case, like in my array has an ID value, you might not, so you could potentially use the index in your loop to provide that as well. This becomes um, even more important, even more crucial to use the key when you have, so you start to have a lot of nested components that, uh, that have the same parent. They need to have unique keys so that you know exactly what data mode is actually using. So there was the key attribute. I should have pressed that in. So directives, we've seen a few of them already. Directives are just special values that have a V hyphen prefix. Uh, directive's job is to reactively apply side effects to the DOM when the value of its expression changes. We can also use VBind, this is one of the many directives built into the end, which uh, actually applies special reactive behavior to the DOM as well. This is essentially just saying keep the element's title attribute up to date with the message property. And if the message changes, then you should also change the title attribute as well, just to make sure that they're kept perfectly in sync. As you're looking at these code samples, try and imagine, try and visualize doing this in another JavaScript library with the current processes. Try and see how it compares, because I'm 90, 95% sure it will probably be easier this way. So essentially the directives, they are easily recognizable. They can be dynamic as well. We saw um, an argument was passed in vbind code on title. So we were explicitly telling it what to actually set. And they can also be written in shorthand as well, so if you makes it even easier to type and work with. A couple of examples, I'm binding an anchor element, and I want the href attribute to be this particular URL. I might as well save myself an energy and uh, just type the bottom line. Save a few keystrokes, does exactly the same thing. I find it actually easy to read as well. In code that I've written a few applications, I, I try and use shorthand, it does, does make it easy. And the same for clicks. The click can work exactly the same way as shorthand instead of the feed by, uh, sorry, the feed on click. You just have an at click. Exactly the same thing, easier to read. And again, the click can be a reference to a JavaScript function or it can be some inline JavaScript code. So let's get down to brass tacks. The really awesome thing about Vue.js is its ability to bind data very easily. I have a two way binding example here. Where I have again my message element, I have an input type where I am setting the value of that input to my predefined static message there, and a button that will clear using inline JavaScript, it will essentially clear that message to a wrong value. So let's see that in action. When we load it up, we can see the input does indeed include that value, but it's not actually reacting at all. The message at the top should be updating, it does clear but it doesn't update at the top, because that wasn't true to way binding. Fair enough, we were outputting the value, but we weren't actually binding it to anything. To do that, you need to use the V model directive. This is a beautiful little nugget that really does make things incredibly effective. This directive allows us to create true two-way data binding, associating both the input and the reactive text output to exactly the same value. So purely by changing that, if we have exactly the same code, we can see that our message is updated. When we clear it out, it clears, and when we type it in again, it's reacting and responding. <coughs> so two-way binding, whenever a model's property changes, updates the element. If the element changes, update 
not in property. It really is that simple. And Hue does make it stupidly easy. We also have directed modifiers as well. So the top example, I can add a dot lazy onto that. I tend to use this when I'm making API requests. Say you have a user interface where you want a user to enter in some search criteria and then fire off an API request to Confusion. Typically, uh, I've done it a lot and I've seen it a lot as well. When a user's typing, you're essentially sending off an API request for every single keystroke. It's not performant, it's intensive, it's messy and it's prone to errors. You might actually get a response back uh, from a previous request while a user's still typing, so you might actually get what you want. Vue allows you to bypass that completely just by adding the dot lazy. So if you know this, I'm going to kind of wait until the user stops typing and then I'm going to fire it on. I mean, true, you can do the same thing in jQuery, but you need to write a lot more code. You need to set timeouts and character detection and things like that. With five extra characters in view, you're done. You can also trim it so you can remove any white space. And you can see in the second example, you can even chain them as well. So we're asking you to wait until the user's finished then send off a white space free value. And at the bottom, even though we have an input type set to text, we can tell if you this input will only accept numeric values. Nice and easy. So event modifiers, noted by the dot notation, all that does matter when writing them. I haven't, as of yet, in all of the applications I've written, experienced a conflict <coughs> by the order of the directives. However, Vue is very good at telling you when you've done something wrong. The console will tell you, um, normally the browser will tell you as well, it will literally pop up with full on error messages. And they're fairly informative, so it should tell you what you've done wrong and give you a rough idea of what, either what you need to fix or what you need to do. I'm going to briefly look at event modifiers as well. This is the only one I'm going to show you. There are a lot of these. Um, they have system modifiers, uh, modifiers. they have a lot of uh, keystroke modifiers. The one that I use a lot is the prevent. I don't have any, but there have been so many times when I've written jQuery code where I press the button and I want to submit a form. Well, sorry, I press the button and I don't want to submit the form, but I want to process the values of that form to then do something else. To do that, I have to write a click handler, then I need to do an event.prevent default, and then I need to do everything else. With you, I just need to say, when you submit, don't submit it, and then do something else for you, please. Again, by the passing in a JavaScript function reference, also in your own JavaScript. When it actually comes to compiling with you, each view instance goes through a very long series of initialization steps when it's created. They're long, but you don't notice them. They're very complex. For example, it needs to set up a data observation, it needs to compile templates, it needs to mount the instance to the DOM, and then it needs to update the DOM when any of your data changes. So along the way, it also runs functions called lifecycle hooks, uh, which gives you, the developer, the opportunity to add some code at particular steps of that initialization process. We're not going to go through all of them. We're, I'm going to show one thing a bit later on that I use when I'm making API requests to my code fusion API. But as an example there, I just the console logged them all out so you can see the process in which they were written. They are very, very useful. Uh, they can be put in the view instance, or when you come to actually make your components, um, they can be put into there as well. Computer properties are also really, really useful in Vue.js. The prime example, a lot of the examples they show online is when you have a value and you want the reverse values. They take a string and they reverse it, and God knows why anyone wants that in their application. They don't really want a reverse string. For me, a useful example of that is creating a full name value. I might just have the first and the last name, but throughout my application, I need to provide the user's full name so they feel warm and cozy when they're using my site. A quick and easy way to do that, instead of having multiple inline JavaScript Lots of code that do it for me. I'm just going to create a computed property. The computed property will be able to access the data scope available to it automatically. So you don't want to pass any arguments or attributes in. And then you can process, manipulate the string, whatever you want to do, and it will just return it for you. And to display it, you're not calling it like a function, you're just displaying it like a variable. It is essentially a property that you're just doing some funky stuff with. 
So we have our full name. Very quick, very, very easy. The great thing about computed properties as well is that they are cached as long as the data does not change. If the data does change, it will still run, and then it will cache that value again until it changes. So they can be very quick and very performant. Watchers are very, very useful in Vue.js. They provide uh, a way for you to do a lot of things. They can be used for uh, detecting changes in the routes and reacting accordingly, or they can be used to some extent for client-side validation as well. They're quite a big subject. This is literally the cliff of it, so I do apologize. So in my example, I've got a message, uh, again, a message set up, uh, hello monkey, and then I have a watch function at the bottom that will, using a little bit of low dash magic to make it a little bit quicker, it will detect the keystroke changes. And if, God forbid, the user enters in monkey with a Y, it will change the value of the error, uh, the has error boolean. And at the very top, I'm binding that, that has error to the class of the span. <coughs> so if that value is ever true, it will apply an alert class to that span. If it's ever false, that class will be completely removed. Again, imagine trying to do that in jQuery. You'd have a lot more lines of code. It would, it would get messy. It does make it really easy. So monkey, yay! Monkey with a red monkey, bad monkey. So very, very quick, very easy client side. Again, can be used for a lot of other things. We also have filters as well. Custom text formatting. You can do whatever you want with this. Common use cases I've seen, I've used, uh, could be to take a particular string value and add um, a currency to the start, or to add a decimal place at the end to a string. Um, you can essentially do whatever you want with these. In this particular example, we have a stupidly long Lauren Gibson text, and we don't want that, we want our users to receive an excerpt of it. So we want to provide one of those nice little read more links and trim it down to essentially whatever length we want, which we can pass through as a parameter. So these are just declared as well using the Microsoft <coughs> syntax. The default parameter is the text value, and then we just pipe split it, and then we provide the name of the filter and whatever arguments we want to put in. This is when we're doing it inline in an instance, or if we're doing it inline in a condition. As your application grows and you realize that you need a lot more uh, read more filters, or you need to convert currency in a lot of other places throughout your site, you can actually have them defined globally as well. If you define anything before you actually create the view instance, Vue will automatically pick it up and register it. So it knows that it's available for use, and it knows that you're probably going to need it, and it will have it available for every night. So I've talked a lot about components, but I haven't actually talked a lot about components yet, so we should probably jump into components. Components are, and I hate saying the building blocks, but they are the building blocks of your application. Everything you do in Vue ultimately becomes a component, and the end goal really is to have everything as a component. When you're developing a Vue application, it really does help to think visually about what it is that you actually want to build. Hopefully you'll have some mock-ups to work from, or a nice HTML template you grab from Theme Forest, others are available. Um, but ideally, you want to look at the elements on the design that you want to build. Find the common uh, design, find the common layouts, the, uh, the areas that are easily duplicated, and turn them into, into components. Essentially, you want to repurpose as much as you can, because you want your code base to be small, you want it to be manageable, and you want it to be testable. So in my awesome mock-up, I have a header, I've got perhaps some blog listings, I might have somewhere where I'm loading in some images from Instagram or from my own gallery. So if I look at this, I need to start thinking, okay, how can I break this out into a few components? The obvious thing would be to have the header, the main body content, the sidebar and the footer, as the own components. Clearly the blog posts are laid out exactly the same, so I'll just have a blog item component. All of the images, although in this particular mock-up they're all the same size, I might have images of various uh, dimensions and heights. But to make things easier, I can turn them, I can create an image component as well. I can then pass uh, specific values into it to define what the width and height should be or various other attributes for that element. 
5381 to control all, that makes it easier. I can even go so far as to turn the, the title into a component and the body content. And while I'm at it, if I've got the header, chances are my header is going to be reused throughout my entire application. I may want to actually have different text in that header. So I'm going to turn that into a component as well. It does sound crazy. It does sound a little bit over the top, but it does make sense eventually. We're going to have a navigation as well, so that will be a component. And just for laughs, we can even turn each individual navigation link into a component, which does sound ridiculous. But we might want to reuse those in the footer. We might want to start them differently based on where it is in the layout. We can even use them in the sidebar. We can control everything, passing data through to it, but just have one component that manages everything. It really does depend how far you want to go and what you want to do with it. Uh, this is completely up to you. There are no hard and fast rules on it. Um, it's just explore, have fun, play around. So when it comes to actually creating components, in this particular instance, we're doing it just like we have with the filters. We are defining our component before the view instance, so it's instantly recognized by the application. We literally give it a name, and then we provide a template for it. If you're doing multi-line, you need to add this to make sure that you can effectively have a multi-line template. But that's it. Even though we have our component name in camel case, you will expect it in, in kebab case when you actually go to output it in your template page. But to include our component, that is all we need to do. We've added it in, and I've got my text box underneath. And when I start typing things into that, the value eventually will update on that particular component. Fantastic resource in components is the ability to communicate between them as well. This is where components become really, really interesting. Without passing data through to them, they're literally just blocks of HTML and that kind of defeats the point of using view as a framework. So it's essential to be able to communicate between them. If you're communicating from a parent to a child, you need to pass props down to it. Props are very, very simply defined. I'd literally give a property name, props, and I would say, hey, the component, you may or may not be receiving something with the value of name or the property name of name. I can then update my actual component to the output that value, again using the mustache braces, and to send it through from my parent to the child at the bottom on the actual component tag. I would pass the prop and the value that I want to send in. You can also use slots as well for components. Slots are a really great way to send content blocks. Instead of just single, single um, values, you can send a whole block of content through. Um, to do this, and content slots and props, try saying that fast up to a few minutes. They can work simultaneously as well. They're not um, independent of each other. You can use them together. You can use them individually. It's completely up to you. But to send a slot through, essentially whatever you put in between your component tag blocks will be the content slot that comes through to your template. And in your template, you would actually have those slot tags as uh, essentially invisible placeholders. So if the content slot is sent through, that those slot tags will be replaced with that content. If you don't send a content slot through, they will not display. You can optionally have a default value between those uh, slot tags. So if you don't send anything through your component block, you can have default holding text up there as well. So you can pass specific values either as props or as content slots through to your children. Again, I really should take up a design course but uh, in that previous example, I've got my input box, and that is my header up at the top, believe it or not. And that is essentially passing the information through from the parent to the child and updating it reactively. So one way communication is great, but ideally we want two way communication. We want our children to be able to communicate back to our parents, back to the parent component. We obviously can't send a prop because a prop is a downward message. To do that, we need to actually emit an event back up <coughs> in, the, uh, in the, the life cycle flow. In this particular example, I have uh, set up a view instance with 
a child's name, and an empty message. I have a couple of methods defined. This is the actual root instance, this is the parent. So I have two methods. One is send message, and if that is ever called, it will update the data child message value with whatever is sent through. We also have clear message, which will obviously clear them out. Again, in the parent template, I can now start to define the user interface. If the child message is available, we'll react and we'll display something. If it's not, we won't. We have our button with an at click event, which will call that clear message. And then we can actually add in our child component. The child component is where we send the props through, as you can see. So we have the child message and the child name. But we are also sending through the at send value, which directly relates to the JavaScript function we sent before, the send message. So we're actually passing that JavaScript reference into the child so that it knows what function to call when it emits the event back up. And finally, we create our child component. So we've declared the props that it should be receiving. We have the name, we have the message. We have the input props for them to, uh, to type into. In this particular example, I will admit, I, I didn't mess up, I did it by design. But I have, uh, it was originally just going to be an on click, so the user would type something in and then they'll click the button and it would fire off. I actually added a key event in there as well, so when the user types in, it automatically sends back to the parent. So the, uh, the button here is kind of redundant, but they essentially do the same thing. And you can see at the bottom, the send message is the one that actually emits the event back to the parent. I know this sounds crazy. If it doesn't make sense, I'm very sorry. I will buy you drinks later. I will not buy you drinks later. Um, but to emit the event backwards, when uh, the click is happening, we say, okay, on click, run the send method. The send method is actually defined in the child. The child will emit an event back to the parent and uh, it will know what method to call. So this is where we actually start to look at the view, the, the view DevTools plugin as well. We have our UI up and running. With view DevTools open, you can see that we were actually able to, to visualize and select our components within our application. If we uh, click on the root component, we can see that the data values are set in the bottom. We can see that the child message is null. We have the, the child name, exactly as we defined it. If we click on the child component, we can see that those values have been passed down as props, as they should be. Again, the message is null, the child's name is visible. So if we, if we see an action, we can, we can see that the uh, child starts to type something in. Uh, it is binding up at the top, so we can see the reactive text display. And we can actually see that the props have updated. So the child itself has updated its own value. And we can clear it out, and again, it's clear to the null. If they continue to type, then things still update. So it's not only binding the data to the output, it's setting the data within itself and sending the data up to the parent as well, as it should do. And here's one of the really useful features in the View DevTools is the ability to actually view the events. So you can see all the events that your application has fired and triggered. You can click on each one and actually inspect which component it came from, what the event was that triggered it. Uh, the payload that, that was sent. It really is useful to kind of find where the big stack of things and um, methods are being called. Really useful, especially when you start to grow your application and have a lot of components. Intentionally and by design, there was an error in that as well. When the clear, so when the silence button was clicked to clear the message, I was actually um, directly mutating the prop value. It did allow me to do it, but Vue.js does complain about it because you really, really shouldn't do it. A property is a bit of information that is passed from the root down into a child component. That should never be changed by the child. It's a one-way communication in that way. So Vue is very good at letting you know what you've done wrong, what you shouldn't do, and just notifying you, hey, you did this, but maybe Google it, check. 
we, we will have a look a little later on how we can successfully actually update values from children back to parents a much easier way, much safer way, I should say, to manage that. But we'll keep going. So at the moment, that was literally just kind of playground stuff. We haven't, as of yet, created a proper app. The quickest and easiest way to get a view app and right is to use the view CMI. If you haven't used NPM before or know your any terminal line access, it's very, very easy. There's a lot out there to help you. To install view CMI, it's just an NPM package. Install it globally using the dash G so you can run it in whatever directory you are in at that time. And just like command box, if you are firing up a new application, you just enter in view, create, and then the name of the app that you want to scaffold. It might ask you a few uh, questions, which linting tool would you like? Um, you just select those available defaults, and then it will create the application for you, fire up the server, give you the port number that it's running on, click on it, and you get greeted with this beauty. So the first thing we do with that is go in the code and rip it all out. It's quite a good one to look at uh, when you actually go into the code to see what they've done, but um, it's, it's also kind of useless as well. So get rid of it, and you can take some ideas from it. But the scaffolding structure is quite clear and evident now that you have a few applications. You will primarily be working in just the source directory, it will have an assets directory inside of which you would place all of your fonts, your images, any videos, whatever you have, they will go into there. The components directory, surprise, surprise, is where you put all of your components. You can nest those to your heart's content in subdirectories, whatever you want. But as far as the framework goes, if you place them all in there, it knows what to do, and you know where all of your code is. The app.view file is now our main component that will be mounted into the DOM. And we'll look at that shortly. And then we have the main JS file. This is now the app's main entry point. This sets up the view instance for us, and it is this file inside of which we will write filters or um, import other scripts. It's also uh, used to actually mount that app component into the DOM itself when it creates the view instance. So, view files are incredible. In the examples we've seen so far, it was kind of piecemeal. We had a component here, we had an instance here, we had bits all over the place. View files are single file components that are very, very clearly defined in structure. They make things much, much easier. This is where the modular side of things starts to come into play. You have at the very top, this is a requirement, you have to have the template inside of which you place your HTML code. You then have your script block inside of which you replace all of your awesome scripting. This is uh, so that contain your, your data object, uh, any computed methods, your lifecycle hooks if you have them, etc. You then also have the optional style block at the bottom. So the great thing about the style block is that you are essentially creating, you're defining your, your CSS within the component for which it relates to. So if I have my, my super mega awesome image component, then any CSS that would relate directly to that, I would define explicitly within that component. You can also add an optional scoped attribute to the style block as well. And that really locks things down. As soon as you add that in, it's telling you this, these styles, this CSS, relates purely to this component, no other component. There would be no CSS rule conflicts, which is fantastic. So by having everything in line in one file, you know exactly where you need to go to update it, you know where you need to go to manage your, your CSS, and you can even lock it down. Very, very quickly as well, there is a multitude of view plugins available. I'm sure you can imagine. If there's a plugin that you think, oh, I, I can really use uh, Font Awesome for this, or I'd like to install Bootstrap into my view application, chances are there is already a plugin out there for you. If not, and you're feeling confident, you can write one. You're capable. They're essentially just a few components. So to install Bootstrap, I would need to install the actual official Bootstrap library and the view version of Bootstrap. And any plugin that you install, you just need to tell the view, hey, here's a plugin, I'd like to use it for you, please. So you would import any uh, particular JavaScript that it needs, any style sheets that you need, and then most importantly, you just tell view, view.use 
playing with clay. Really easy. Routing in your application. This is another uh, non standard library, but it is written by the same folks. So it is a, a companion library. You need to install it separately, it's view router. And for anyone that's ever written any routing configuration before, it's very similar, certainly, to box. You have an array of your routes, you provide the path it relates to, the actual component that should be loaded when that route is accessed, and a name for that route. Because when you actually create the links, they are not name based. We can also have a wildcard route at the bottom to handle uh, any users hitting URLs that we haven't defined, and that would just open up. Um, in this particular case, a 404 component. Because you need to define the actual components in the root, we also need to import um, and create a components at the top of the page as well. If we want to pass through values, uh, dynamic values in our URLs, again, very similar to Coldbox and other frameworks, you just do a code on the value that you want to send through. And when you need to access that on whatever component or whatever template, it is available through the global scope. So this root.params and then whatever the value. The root.params is inspectable, if that is a word. Uh, you, can, you can view it, you can test it, you can check it in the view dev tools plugin. So once we have our router config defined, we then need to basically do the same thing. Tell the view, we've got some routes now, please can you use them for me? So we need to import the view router, we need to import our view config, we need to tell the user to use it, and then we just define the route at the end. There are a couple of different modes you can have. You can have like, hash bangs and things like that, uh, or you can have the plain history mode is just forward slash followed by whatever endpoint I'm defined. Because um, when, when I'm writing view apps, I kind of write the URLs to look like a, an actual web app without having crazy characters in. I think that, that kind of ruins the visuals. Well, that's just a new bit of an address bar. Creating the links. View router has that tag as well for us. So we have a router link tag. And using the attribute binding, we can just pass it the tag, the URL that we want it to hit, and we're done. The other thing that we actually need to add in as well is the router view tag at the bottom. The router view tag is essentially the container for the rendered components. So when we hit, say, an about us URL, view knows, okay, the about component should be used, and it pops it right in the root of view um, holding div. <sighs> Using an API. So we have our application set up, we have our root set up, it's time to use an API. In terms of actually fetching the external data, there is there seems to be just the one library that is the recommended de facto standard for view. There is a fetch uh, native request library, but I've had problems with that. It's not compliant in all browsers. It can cause issues. It certainly doesn't work in older versions of IE, as I found out, unfortunately, once. When I push something live just using the native uh, fetch API, and it works, it was the classic, it worked on my machine, but I never thought to actually test it on IE later i 7 which has its own version of fetch and just did not work. So Axios is the preferred uh, fetch library of choice. It supports promises. If you're new to promises, don't worry, they are ridiculously easy. You can transform JSON data, you can do a lot with it, and it has really, really good browser support as well. So this one kind of works out of the box. Unfortunately, it is another install that you need to do. It doesn't come shipped. This is one of the reasons why Vue.js is very lightweight. It has it's very stripped back, which is great because then you have control over what you're actually putting in. So we have Axios going in. And just to make as an example of promise requests, for those that don't know, it's very, very simple. You can check everything out. It's nice and easy. You'll uh, learn to love it, embrace it, and hug it on a daily basis. So if I have my application, that text is ridiculously small. But I've stripped out the contents of my, my view file, inside of which I want to request all of my musicians from my Confusion API. At the very, very top, I've imported Axios, because otherwise few will not know how to actually fetch the data. 
Yes. I've also imported my components that I need to use on that page, and I have the actual artist item. I like to use fake so that the users can see something loading when uh, I'm putting data in. I don't want them to see a spinny thing. I don't want them to see a blank empty page. Um, I would like them to see, just as you know, Facebook or, or other apps, the, the grey kind of CSS box. They know something's loading. It's going to be here. It's going to actually have to tell view that you're going to use them. So there is a components block at the top as well. Because otherwise, when you put the tags in, it's not going to know what it needs to. I have my life cycle hook. So this is the life cycle hook that I use when I'm making API requests. It's the creative. It's before it's actually mounted in the DOM, but while view is creating it, I want to call a function that's going to start fetching my data. So I'm getting it just that little bit quicker. And that calls a fetch artist method, and at the bottom that uses Axios, and that goes to my Confusion API. Grabs that data back for me. As I mentioned, if we're uh, if we're loading that information in, I have predefined um, fakes. I have a fake value set to three, so that when I'm loading information in, it will display using Bootstrap three columns, so the user will know that something's going in. I also have an artist property set to null. As soon as my um, my data actually loads in that artist array will be populated with the response from my, my API request. So I'm loading up, this loading is set to true, I have my fakes, so it's looping over my fake item, it's going to display some nice shiny stuff. And once my API request works, it will populate the value of the artist's array, and also then define is loading equals false, because the data has come in. So instantly using the view directives, my UI will change without me having to write crazy jQuery code that checks the API response, checks the, the status, hide this element, hide that element, do a million things. View knows because I've given it clear directives for what it needs to do. So is loading equals false? So now I can use a V4 and I can loop over my artist's array. I do apologize for what was very, very small. Um, I then have an artist image component to display the actual data. I'm passing in the prop, the actual artist object from my API response. Inside of that artist image, I actually have this specific array, so the specific URL to my artist detail page. And I'm passing through the artist ID as the parameter for my URL as well. And inside of uh, the artist image, I'm also using a, create, uh, a computed property to generate the uh, image file name. So using the artist name to convert it to lowercase, adds in some underscores, because I already have those in my assets directory. So I don't need to send through extra data in my API. I can use the use computer pr uh, property to pull that out and uh, display my image. Finally, on the artist detail page, when you actually go and view a specific musician, Again, I have a lifecycle hook in created. This fires off another API request, but this one sends through the ID value that I've got from the params object and makes the request. However, I'm making a second API request. In an ideal world, I would like to make just one API request, pull all of my artists down, and then grab the specific artist, the specific musician information from the array that I already have. It might only save me milliseconds, but it saves me milliseconds and leaves less room for errors by having another API request in place. But a very, very quick example, I have uh, the application now. So if I refresh it, I've got dev tools open so we can see what's going on. You can see my fancy schmancy loading screen, that's really nice, isn't it? Maybe I have got design skills. Um, I have another similar API request on the artist page, but that wasn't showing anything loading, just to show you how dull it is. And then if I click through on a specific musician, again it shows the loading information, and it's got that. And the roots actually update, the data updates in, uh, in the new dev tools as well. So we can inspect everything as we're going along. But if you consider that the issue with having to make a second API request for data that, in theory, we've already received, 
Or if you consider uh, the previous example where the user was updating an input box and directly mutating a prop, which should not happen. Ideally, we need a way to effectively share data throughout our entire view application without having to pass props up, so without having to pass props down and emit events all the way up again. That's costly, massively prone to errors, and you've essentially got no control over that data. Anything can change and the application can break. So to solve the data consistency problem, we have Vuex. Vuex is, again, another external library, but again, written by the Vue team, designed explicitly for the very sole purpose of managing your application's state data. If we had a single view component, this would be the data process. We'd have a view, it would pass in actions, it would pull the data from the state, and so on and so on. As soon as you start to have multiple components or nested components in the chain, things get much, much harder. So Vuex enters to solve that problem. Now this diagram looks a lot scarier than it actually is. This is the uh, solution that Vuex provides. We still have our views, we have our getters and our setters and our mutations, but Vuex is global. It is available for every single component in your application. It can be used everywhere. Your API will interact directly with it. DevTools can read from it, which means you can inspect it. It's a fantastic solution. So it essentially massively helps you to solve issues with shared data and shared state. In theory, there is no one true way of writing a store. There are requirements on what properties you need to add in, which we'll look at in a second. So in a good way, it's great that there's no one true way. I've added a little red dot in there because in a way it's kind of bad not to have one true way because you might Google for a solution and find five different answers to the particular problem. The big downside of Vue, uh, Vue X is, well, it's not a big downside. It adds more code. So if your end <coughs> goal solution was to create a really streamlined application with as little code as possible, it doesn't add too much, but it does add enough to maybe just have to write a few more test cases. But the problem that it solves is worth the extra code. So in comparison with our view instance, I'll show you how similar they are. Uh, view instance on the left has our data objects. The store on the right has state. Both of these are reactive data objects. They do essentially exactly the same thing, they're just called different things. The view instance has methods which update the instance data. View store has actions which update the state. The view instance has computed properties as we've seen, which can, uh, can pull the information from the store. Vuex has getters, which pull the information from the state. The only difference is that the store also has the mutations. These are used to commit and track changes within your Vuex application. They seem kind of redundant, but they are very, very important. The best practice is to have actions call your mutations, and then your mutations change the values in the state. It's a couple of extra lines of code per call, but once you've got it defined, it is worth it. That allows you to leave a truly trackable state change for everything that you do. You can open up Vue DevTools, you can see every single change that you've made, you can use Vue DevTools to roll back to certain changes, you can inspect every single bit of data. It's a lovely, lovely thing. We are almost done. Thank you very much for doing that. So to set up a state for my particular application, there are a number of ways you can do it. You can do it directly within the Vuex store and have your, uh, your actions, your mutators, your getters defined within. But if your application starts to grow, it might be worthwhile building modules, which I've done from the start. So at the very top, I'm importing a module file called Artists. It's just a JavaScript file. But it allows me to define specific states, values, and properties that relate directly to my artist's API. If my application grows and I might want to put out record listings for each artist when I click on them, 
I would prefer to have another module for that. So everything is clear, everything is separate, everything is testable, than having a huge file that has a million and one things listed. If you do use modules, you just need to let the store know that I have modules. It's really easy. So if we actually go into our modules file, we define the state just as we have on our components where we defined the data object, we just can find, uh, define another uh, object which contains our initial state, our default values. So our artist list into which we will put all of our musician information is empty by default. We can even move our loading boolean value to this so we, we actually take code away from our components and keep it within the store. We then define our getters. These interact directly with the state and pull whatever information we want them to put out of it. So if I want to check if something's loading or not, I can do that. If I want to pull the entire um, array of musicians, I can do that. We then need to define our actions. This, uh, this actually handles fetching data from the API. Uh, I have a few more actions, but I didn't want to blind you with time texting it. So this is the most important one in my particular application. I've moved everything into this. Everything is now controlled by the Vuex state. When I ask to get the list of artists, I'm first setting the loading state to true. So instantly, my reactive application, any text that I want to display, those shiny loading boxes, they will start doing their shiny loading thing. I can then make the API request itself, and once that has returned data, I'll process it, do whatever I need to do to it. I can set my artist array in the store to contain the value returned from the API, and then instantly I can switch the loading status back to false. So as far as my user is concerned, they've seen some shiny loading things, and then they've got data. They don't need to interact with anything. I don't need to have a lot of uh, extra code that could potentially break elsewhere. And the massive benefit here is that every single component in my application has access to this, uh, this store in this state. And then finally, we have the mutations. So following the convention, we have the mutations that directly update the values in the state themselves. They're literally just uh, confirmed setters. So we're passing the value that we want to store in, and they would update that so the related property with the new value which means we are completely tracking that. So we can update our app. If I jump back to the page that, that had a lot more stuff in it, it's now a lot smaller. Using Vue.js, sorry, Vue.x, we can import a couple of helper methods. We've got map getters and map actions. These allow us to access those, uh, that functionality that we've just written in a shorthand fashion. Uh, the getters are included as computing properties, and the actions are included as methods that we can call. We no longer have the API request directly in there because the state handles it for us now. Because we've changed that, we know the that we used to have because it's all included in the state. So we just update our, our loop, and now it's artist in artist list array, which is one of the getters from the Vuex store. Using that, when we run our application, we can instantly see, when we make our API request, that things are happening. Uh, the set loading status was changed, the artist list was updated, and then the set loading status was changed once again. This is all within the view data tools. We can see every single step, every single thing that's happening. We can view the uh, mutation data at the top, we can see the actual contents of the state now, and we can even see the contents of any getters that we might want to request just so we know it has everything that we need. We can also update our artist detail page. We can finally strip out that second API request. It's now redundant. We have all of the information. Now we just need to ask the store, get me this object that relates to this specific ID. And when we run that as well, we can see at the very, very bottom, we have our current artist object is now defined, and our current artist ID is now set as well. So in terms of using Vuex, why would you want to use it? At first glance, it might seem slightly confusing. It massively, massively helps reduce any data issues, any complexity of sending data around, data being updated in one component where it might be needed in another. 
every bit of your code is in one place, again, so it's testable, it's manageable, it's maintainable. And using Vuex to create uh, posts to your API is very easy as well. We've seen that we can easily pull out objects of data from our local store. If our view, uh, if our user updates it, if you update that particular object, we'd send it back into the store, and then we could run a request to post that particular payload back up to our new server and update it. <coughs> it keeps everything in one place, nice and easy. Believe it or not, that was also the Cliff Notes version. So you, you, you stuck with that very well. There is a lot more information on Vuex, so definitely check out uh, their official site if you want to learn more. And I know I'm very rapidly running out of time, so the last thing I wanted to briefly touch on is Cobalt Elixir. This isn't directly view related as such, although it does have incredible view properties. This is a really nice um, tool from the incredible guys at Portis. They have uh, ported over a Laravel PHP project that is essentially um, a Webpack API communicator for Cold Fusion. And if you don't know what Webpack is, it allows you to, to bundle up your assets, whether it's your images, your CSS, your JavaScript, whatever it might be. If anyone's ever used uh, Grunt or, or Gulp before, um, and you've run those to combine and collate various resources, Webpack does it but a billion and one times better. But Elixir can handle it all for you, which is really, really nice. Uh, it's a standalone module, but it works beautifully well with Box and Content Box. Uh, and this is a very, very simple code sample. Uh, I'm literally throwing it a few CSS files, and it will essentially generate those, it will collate everything, and it will return um, one <coughs> combined minified CSS file for my application. The same, the same works with JavaScript as well. So if you do start to build up a Vue.js uh, Vue application, it will essentially take all of your components, compile, transpile, and do whatever it needs, chuck them into one really tiny JavaScript file, which means your site loads a lot faster. Of course, there is a skeleton available for that as well, because the authors guys think of everything, and there is a Vue-specific skeleton, which I would highly recommend checking out. Um, this, if you just Google Combox Vue.js, you can find it really easy. It is a Combox application, and as soon as you run it and start it, you need to run in the app install to fetch some JavaScript dependencies, run box install to fetch some CFML dependencies, start the server up using command box, and you'll be greeted with a very familiar site, um, with the input box and the rest of the text at the top, but you instantly have a CFML powered cold box application with Vue.js and Webpack functionality all built in. It's incredibly cool, so you can write and continue to write your cold fusion modules, your, your cold box modules, your content box modules, and you can have another terminal window open with uh, no line that will essentially combine and collate and minify and warn you of any errors as you're updating your Vue.js files. If, like me, you like to write um, the Cobalt application with an API included, that's even better, uh, whether it's a nested module or in a local handler. You're essentially just calling your API within your own application using Vue.js, and it's very, very quick, very, very awesome. So I highly recommend checking that out as well. So in terms of where next, Apart from um, to the pub, <laughs> some additional Vue.js tools that might be worth checking out. <clears throat> Obviously, the first point of call would be the Vue.js official site. There is a lot more, believe it or not. It might feel like I've told you everything, but trust me, I have not told you everything. That was the lightest I could get it to tell you the basics. Um, so definitely check out Vue.js. If you do like the framework side of things, there are two brothers that have created a Vue.js framework called Nuxt.js. It is a convention-based framework, so uh, if you're familiar and comfortable with cold box and other frameworks, this might be one you might want to look at. It's pure Vue.js, but it is convention-based. with clear uh, directories and application structures on where you should put certain files. The one good thing about Nuxt is it also has server-side rendering capabilities as well. So you can create your Vue.js files, and either locally using your terminal or using Bitbucket pipelines or some other process, you can have your static site generated for you, uh, fully reacted, but ready to deploy to any static site hosting server. 
And of course, cobalt to later there, it's so much more on that. I literally jumped over that one. But I would highly recommend it. Definitely check that out if you can. There was more. There were transitions and animations and a million and one other things that I highly recommend you have a look at. But in terms that was what uh, UJS. In terms of why the UJS, and I'm going to get to this very quickly, I do apologize. I have seen over the years a lot of code and a lot of applications, mine included, where uh, people, including me, have tried to make API requests using jQuery. When jQuery came out, it was incredible. It opened the doors for uh, JavaScript development, it made it accessible, it made it easier for everyone. But the more I see it, the more I see it, we have to explicitly find certain elements by accessing them through class or, or ID. And although in the real world we should only define it once and reuse that, uh, that reference to that code, you will find the same um, you know, jQuery call to ID on blah dotted through the code, which is it's slow because you're, you're searching the whole every single time. To make an API, uh, API, IPA, 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 to make an API request in jQuery, it's, it's easy enough. But the more I look at it now, I'm starting to find the flaws in it, and certainly in the legacy code, we can find certain other things in. In terms of toggling um, element visibility, in terms of click management, so click here, it fires off an API request. Now hide this, show a spinny thing to let the user know something's happening. Now the data's back, we should probably pass that data. Now we need to check the status of the data. Now we need to manipulate the data, and now we need to show the hide the spinny thing and show all the It's a lot of code. <laughs> Microphone is also given up. It's a lot of code, um, which Vue.js completely rectifies in my eyes. Why I use Vue.js and why I recommend Vue.js is one word. It might look complex, it might be a slight learning curve, but it offers a greater level of simplicity, I think, um, to manage things that should be easy to do. But certain frameworks that we have used in the past don't make it easy anymore. So it's very easy to buy into data for aging elements. It's very easy to control your data in the file to see what's going on. It is highly extensible in terms of both the available plugins and what you can do and how you can format and structure your application using components. But ultimately, and this is totally my own, um, my own opinion, why I think that people should use Vue.js for their, their APIs or for applications. That's just fun. <laughs> the first time I used it and I saw something being updated on the fly and I saw the shiny, flashy thing instead of the spinny, boring thing, I honestly had a smile on my face. It was minimal lines of code and I saw something quite cool happening that made me as a developer go, hmm, I like that. And I still get that feeling every time I'm developing. So hopefully, if I haven't brought you to tears, and if I have, I'm very, very sorry. That was a lot to go through, and I do owe you all a massive round of applause for sitting through it. Um, hopefully, you might take a look at it one day, and you might get that. Mm. That was fun, feeling too. Thank you very much.